anywhere. Okay. I'm going to start from up here, I think. Um. Excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Doreen Bogdan Martin, and I'm the director of the Telecommunications Development Bureau at the International Telecommunications Union. I would like to welcome all of you this afternoon to this IGF main session where we will be looking at achieving the SDGs in the digital age. Half of the planet is now online, and that's great news. At least for those of us that can actually connect. But how about the rest? How about the 3.6 billion people that are still totally cut off from a world that the rest of us here take for granted. I bet none of us can actually imagine living without the internet. And right now, every second person on the planet has to. The internet is a rich environment. We often use it for simple things. We use it to check the weather. We use it to do shopping, to play games. We use it to check in for our flights. But we, the privileged few, we need to remind ourselves, we need to remind ourselves that the internet can be absolutely transformational for those, of, for those that do not have access to books and newspapers, those that do not have access to teachers, to health professionals, to agricultural experts, those that are seeking jobs, looking for markets for their products, and looking to have access to financial services. The internet has changed our world, but that transformational, transformative potential is magnified by a thousand times in the hands of people that have been held back for generations through the lack of access, the lack of access to the power of information. Ladies and gentlemen, the international community has a moral imperative, a moral imperative to ensure that all people enjoy access to the same opportunities. In today's world, leaving no one behind equals access to ICTs. The UN Secretary General reinforced the importance of technology and the sustainable development goals through his high-level panel on digital cooperation. That word, cooperation, is key. When we connected the first 50% of the world, it was through competition. But in order to connect the other half of the world, it's going to be about cooperation and collaboration. It's also going to be about thinking about new ways, new ways that we can bring meaningful connectivity to the unconnected communities. Services that matter to us might not be the same services that matter to them. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us this afternoon an amazing, energetic, very talented, and engaged panel. We will be structuring the next two hours focusing on three key areas, people, planet, and prosperity. How can digital drive the SDGs in each of these areas? And for each of these key areas, I will invite two of our experts to make some, some remarks. I will then invite comments from the other panelists and then we will open to you, the audience, the audience that is here physically, as well as the audience that is following online. 
But before we hear from our panelists, we have a distinguished speaker amongst us. Uh, and I would like to invite Under Secretary Jen Min Yu, the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs at UNDESA, to please make some opening remarks and launch us in our discussions. Under Secretary, please. Thank you, Dori, for moderating this panel, and thank you for your inviting me to address the, the audience. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to share some reflections on the issue of achieving the SDGs in the, age, in the, in the digital age. Four years after its adoption, the commitment to the 2030 Agenda for sustainable development, our shared blueprint for fair globalization remains steadfast at the highest level of government. At the SDG summit convened at the United Nations in September, give us an opportunity to reflect on our achievements and take stock of the challenges we face in achieving sustainable development goals. Many countries have been proactively implementing the SDGs. We continue to see achievements in poverty decline and improvements in health and education outcomes. Yet, the shared view is that global response is not sufficiently transformative. Slowing economic growth, rising inequality, and climate change are squeezing the prospects of sustainable development. At the same time, technologies and the internet have transformed information sharing, revolutionized industries, saved lives, and advanced development. There's no doubt that new technologies, such as artificial intelligence and the internet of things, can help us achieve the goals and improve the lives of all. We need to continue to showcase how they can make meaningful contributions to the SDGs. The IGF is one such important platform. There are many others, including STI Forum, organized by my Department of Economic and Social Affairs, and the WISIS Forum, organized by ITU. I believe each forum has a unique role to play and that they complement each other. I also believe that you have heard many times in each of these fora, the internet and ICTs are cross-cutting enablers for SDGs. Yet, this is true, but these enablers come with many challenges, and in most cases, they create new ones. Some of the pressing issues and challenges facing the internet ecosystem include digital divides, capacity building, cybersecurity, the privacy of internet users, and online protection of human rights. There are also unforeseeable risks, which we are only just beginning to appreciate that impact the future of work, global security, and people's trust and well-being in a digital society. But how do we overcome the challenges and the risks? How do we ensure that no country and no one is left behind? The positive power of the internet and ICTs can only be harnessed if people have a real sense of public trust security, and stability in the digital space. It's also critical to prioritize technologies that are most needed for sustainable development. To follow up the recommendations by the Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation, 
we must strengthen cooperation and harness the full potential of technological breakthroughs. Distinguished participants, the IGF must respond through the UN's communion law to bring everyone together, regardless of the stakeholder groups and the backgrounds. The aim to find points of convergence and consensus while also acknowledging the points of divergence. Clearly, the IGF needs to further strengthen its role as being a global policy forum for internet governance related issues. In Berlin, we see an increased engagement of high level decision makers from governments and the private sector, as well as technical experts and the civil society. They come to the forum to find innovative policy solutions to the challenges affecting the internet and technologies. We should keep up this momentum in future meetings of the IGF. I understand that there is now a network of over 120 national, regional, and youth IGFs, or the acronym NRS in short, that has expanded over the past two to three years. Indeed, multi-stakeholder engagement on the local level is critical if we want to understand the nature of issues and availability of resources in all communities. The complexity of the internet does not allow for a siloed approach or the unification of problems and solutions. This is why we are fortunate to have these community-led open national and regional IGF processes. And we are even more fortunate to have, th to have them as a partners to guide our vision towards safe and accessible internet for all. We need to op optimize these partnerships and capacity development opportunities. Distinguished participants, in conclusion, let us remember that sustainable development is a global endeavor, both at the inception and in its outcomes. So is the IGF. The challenges we face today, rising inequality, uneven growth, climate change, and a fast-paced technological change, among others, demand a collective effort and a stronger multilateral response. As you have heard many times, the internet and technology are critical for achieving SDGs, but there are also many challenges. We must continue to come together to discuss everyone's concerns. In doing so, I believe we can turn the advancement of these technologies into the benefits of humankind and together make sustainable development a reality. I thank you for your attention and I wish you have a very fruitful discussion. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Under Secretary General. Thank you for, for sharing your, your vision and for helping to frame our, our discussions this afternoon. Uh, I appreciate your uh, identifying some of the opportunities, the challenges, and of course the, the risks. And as you, you rightly said, um, sustainable development is really a global endeavor, one for all of us. And I want to take this opportunity to commend you and your team uh, for your efforts in bringing us all together in the IGF and of course for, for embracing multi-stakeholderism and ensuring that all groups are, are represented. So thank you very much. Uh, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna move into our panel. Uh, as I mentioned before, we will structure our discussion in sort of three uh, segments. Uh, I think as you all know, the 2030 agenda is a plan uh, of action, a plan of action for people, for the planet, and also for prosperity. So we will start first our discussions looking at people. Um, as you know, the SDGs 
basically declared that the world's determination to end poverty, to end hunger uh, in all of their forms and dimensions, and to ensure that all human beings can fulfill their potential in dignity and equality and in a healthy environment. Digital technologies, if carefully managed, can have an important role to play in ensuring sustainable and equitable societies, as the Undersecretary General has just said so well. So in this first part, we will be touching on the SDG, well, SDG 1 on no poverty, on 2, zero hunger, 3, good health, 4, education, 5, gender equality. Uh, I'm sure you all know the SDGs by heart. Um, 11, sustainable cities and communities, and SDG 16, on peace, justice, and strong institutions. And so our first panelist uh, is Alexandria Walden. Alexandria uh, is the policy lead for human rights and, and freedom of expression at, at Google. And Alexandria, we, if we could ask you to uh, share uh, some of the challenges identified, I would say particularly in the context of, of rapid digital transformation for developing economies, as well as for vulnerable groups. Uh, and if you could also share some of your thoughts about possible routes for overcoming those challenges. Alexandria, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for in inviting um, Google to participate in this conversation today. This is something um, obviously from the top of the company all the way embedded down through our engineers. Um, we're thinking about how um, we proceed and how our products make sense for the world and getting everyone else online. So for me, when I think about the SDGs, um, I think immediately about their role in helping us realize human rights around the globe. Um, and that means things like privacy, like freedom of expression, like non-discrimination, um, and then in other areas, um, the ways in which it can help us uh, take tremendous strides in the areas of health and fighting poverty um, and many of the other topics that other panelists will cover. But when I think about human rights, I'm thinking about the ways in which private sector in particular has a responsibility to both help advance human rights and to protect and the sort of protect and respect framework um, that we're a part of and how that feeds into reaching these goals. So, as several others alluded to, um, digital technology and the internet has, have allowed uh, mankind to make tremendous strides in sharing information and addressing some of these areas that we've talked about. But it's important for us to understand how um, we can learn, how we can ensure that we're learning the lessons um, from where we faced challenges in the past and build upon those to, um, as we are seeking to engage and get every, every person online. So well, the thing that I most want to focus on um, in terms of how we face these challenges, like I said, that, um, that connect to privacy, to freedom of expression, to discrimination, et cetera, is to ensure that companies in the private sector are focused on their responsibilities under the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Fundamentally, those core, that core framework is connected to the way in which we should be thinking about the SDGs at our company. Uh, there are many ways in which we are thinking about the environment and individuals and communities across our products and the way that they use them. And the UNGPs are the way in which we operationalize that. The UN Guiding Principles help us think about um, any given individual product and how it's, um, how it's being used in the world and how we think about uh, mitigating any potential harms and think about all of the benefits that can bring. So I just want to sort of underscore that point in terms of always ensuring that we are looking at the frameworks that are pre-existing um, when we're addressing the challenges that we've seen in the past. Um, we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, instead, we should focus on the frameworks that we currently have and the ways in which those were developed in multi-stakeholder settings. Um, one of the things that um, I think we've learned is that um, 
companies alone or governments alone or civil society alone cannot do this. It is when we work together, when we're in conversation, learning about impacts and possibilities and opportunities um, that we see the best of what technology can offer. And so I just wanted to underscore that as part of the ways in which we can do the amazing things that emerging technologies will allow us to do. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, now going to turn to His Excellency, the, the Vice Minister of ICTs from, from Paraguay, uh, Miguel um, Martin. Uh, I had the opportunity of, of visiting your beautiful country uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, and visiting some of the local schools outside of Asuncion. Uh, Vice Minister, if you could share with us um, your uh, experience coming from a landlocked developing country um, if you could share you know, some, of, some of your experiences and also share with us some of the projects that you have been rolling out to facilitate digital transformation, please. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to say that um, we're really thankful for the invitation of being here as a country and also announce that it's the first time uh, this we come as a big delegation of 10 people and also as a multi-state delegation. We come with the uh, government, uh, the Congress, and also the uh, social civil representation. So it's really good to announce that. And um, first of all, when you think uh, of internet for all as a, a necessity for a country or, or, or for the world, we uh, find ourselves with a, with a very big challenge for us, which is our position as a landlocked country. This means we don't have uh, possibility to connect ourselves to the um, submarine cables, fiber, fiber optics. So we have to negotiate with our neighbors, Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, in a way to find uh, better solutions for uh, better bandwidth uh, and, uh, of course, the price of access to internet to everyone. This is a situation we also talked about when you were there, and we are finding the ways on how to do it. We, are, we have a challenge as uh, diplomacy to, to work on, but uh, it, this could also uh, be um, an advantage for others to, uh, to make uh, not really or good uh, offers for us, like um, it's, since it's really very difficult to deploy fiber optics for us, um, and uh, they offer uh, rent to rent the infrastructure and other offers that we have to look at the best. And as you said, we have uh, now going on this digital agenda project for the first time, in which we are addressing this uh, infrastructure situation, but as as an, a person who experienced another uh, project related to ICTs, I would like to say that uh, when we started One Laptop Per Child project, in which I was a founder, uh, I was able to see uh, how bringing the computers just to the kids wasn't the solution. Uh, I took, was a volunteer in Africa too, in Rwanda, where I also took the, the project. We thought of uh, quality of education for all when we took the project to everyone. But after years, we saw uh, giving the infrastructure wasn't the solution at all. But I would like to, uh, I don't want to think of inter internet that way. I think internet uh, by itself, it is a big solution uh, when you give the opportunity to anyone to access to information, communication, and this is also for countries uh, 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 that are trying to strengthen their democracy. It is a very, really big, important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to turn to my other fellow panelists and see if you have any comments on what you just heard from Miguel or from Alexandria before I open to the floor. Paolo Midi, do you want to jump in? Melissa, you want to go first? Yeah. Okay. So, um, for me, I, I think one thing struck that, that you just said, and it's about giving infrastructure, is not the only solution. Um, I uh, am very passionate about digital skills and digital intelligence, and I think it's important that when people are getting connected, they have the right skills. 
and they have meaningful skills to make meaningful use of the internet. When I do my talk, I'll do a little bit, I'll do a little bit of a deep dive, but um, that for me is such a critical part of being connected and driving mean meaningful connectivity. Go ahead, Olamidi, please. All right, um, mm. I'm going to speak to Melissa um, in terms of um, giving access to the vulnerable, giving access to the less privileged in the world. Now, I understand um, in 2017, I think Google did something in Nigeria and it's a bit um, charitable. Without you having access to the internet, without you subscribing to any particular ISP, you could actually um, access Google's like um, two, three pages. For example, you were looking for a meaning of a word and um, you just log on to the internet, even without you subscribing to any particular ISP, internet service provider, Google made it possible for people in Nigeria, I don't know any other part of the world anyway, whether they had access to that as well, for them to be able to search, maybe just for about uh, three, four minutes. So I understand if they had that capacity, they could always extend it to some other areas. For example, speaking for, for, for Nigerian populace, that some places, just like um, the problem they have in Paraguay, or, or, although ours is not landlocked, but um, some other social problems that would not really make um, internet or uh, um, the, 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 the wires that you spread around, or the, the ground cables, the fibers to, to really reach them. But that I believe that the, the technology can always improve to such an extent that the vulnerable can easily access internet. Thank you. Um, actually, before I hand over to, to Luis, I, I, should, I should have introduced you before I let you, you speak, Melissa. So Melissa Sassi uh, is the chair of the IEEE Digital Skills Group. She's also with IBM. Uh, as the um, program startup lead, program. startup program manager. Uh, and Olomidi uh, Babalola is from Nigeria and is the managing director of um, Babalola, the Babalola firm doing human rights and, and, and privacy as well. Luis Neves uh, is leading Jesse. Um, and was previously at, at Deutsche Telekom, where you were the senior VP for climate and sustainability efforts. So we're delighted to have you as well. Uh, and my friend over here, Giza, used to be with me in the ITU, uh, is now the acting secretary general for the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization. Uh, and before she was with the ITU, where she was doing emergency uh, and LDC work, she was actually the uh, assistant Vice CEO uh, in the ICT ministry in Samoa. So really delighted to have uh, all of you up here. And now with that, um, Luis, if you want to share some, some comments or re reflections in the context of the people segment of our discussion, please, Luis. Yes, thank, thank you so much, Doreen. Uh, I want to, to raise a couple of issues uh, in light of uh, a very recent report that we have done called Digital with Purpose. Uh, this is a report that took Jesse six months to, to deliver. It was done by Deloitte <clears throat> uh, together with uh, 150 people around the world. We looked to seven different technologies uh, in relation to the SDGs. And uh, we visited more than 2,000 sources of information as we were doing the report. And I will present some findings on my short keynote. Um, what I'd like to bring the to the, the, this discussion, because we're talking about human rights, um, about privacy and security, is that one of the most critical areas that we identified in our report is the discussion about human rights and privacy and security. And this is becoming extremely critical in, in today's context when we look at developments that are taking place and uh, when we are looking how technologies are misused in the interest of some. So we, we need to take those aspects into, into account as well. So technologies are extremely good, and our report shows that. Fantastic, they will deliver 22% of the achievements of the SDGs by 2030. But we need to address the, what we call the externalities, uh, also connected with the technologies. And we need to understand that if we want to ensure trust 
in the technology, we also need the companies to step up and take responsibility. So they have to, the companies have to be accountable in the way that they provide those technologies. The second point that I would like to raise in connection to the SDGs is that the fundamental technology to ensure SDG achievement is connectivity. We need to provide connection to people. So when Doreen said we still have half of the population of the world without access to technology. So the question is, how are we going to ensure that this happens? So maybe we need to revisit uh, something that we had in the past. In the past, we had the concept around uh, what we used to call um, access to everybody. So what we call it in uh, providing universal a access. Yeah. And that was the responsibility of, of governments, of policymakers. In, in the old times, when, when telecommunications were still in the public sector. Today, because of competition of the new global environment, we see lots of private companies. It's good that this is happening. But we also need to think what kind of model do we need as to ensure that those three six point billion of people will have access to technology because technology will be fundamental to achieve the SDGs and to get prosperity across the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and thank you for that, uh, Luis. Of course, you know, back in the day in the 80s when Sir Donald Maitland launched his report on the missing link, um, and some of us remember it was about how long you would have to actually walk to get to a, a fixed line, you know, it, it calculated by a number of hours and days. And I mean, of course, we're not talking about fi fi fixed telephone line connectivity anymore. And so I'd like uh, your point and I'd like to hear from the audience on the how, you know, how are we gonna get there? And when the UN Secretary General opened the IGF yesterday, uh, he spoke about connecting the world by 2030 being a shared, uh, priority and as you were saying, Alexandria, it's it's a it has to be shared. It's not just for governments or just for the private sector. It's for all of us. It has to be our our shared priority. But before I turn to the audience, Giza, did you want to add a quick comment before we open up? Yes, um, thank you so much for inviting me here. Of all these problems, when you listen to it, it comes one thing in mind. These are global challenges that need global solutions. And how do we do that? We do that by collaboration, communication, and better coordination. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Okay, the floor is open for a first round of, of questions or comments. Uh, I'd invite you to focus on the, the comments of the panelists that you've heard. Uh, or the context of people, because we're on the people segment of our discussion. Are there any questions? We have microphones placed. There's four microphones around the room. And if you wish to make a comment or ask a question, please approach the microphone and introduce yourself. Okay, I see a first comment or question. Mei-Ling, you want to introduce yourself? It's too high. Please. Hi. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Mei Lin Fung from the People Centered Internet, which I co founded with Vint Cerf. I want to thank the thoughtful comments of the panelists. Um, I want to say that the, the statements have been very inspiring, that we have to learn how to collaborate. And actually, we hear this in every session we have to learn to collaborate. We actually need to do it. Mm -hmm. We need to practice at it. We're like at the very beginning of a long journey and we have to start playing the instruments and listening to each other and like an orchestra, learn to make music. And I don't see that we're actually developing the tools for, for addressing that big gap. We, we can't keep saying we need the elephant, the elephant's in the room, but we're not building the elephant. So I just throw that down as a comment. Well said, thank you, Mei Ling. So we can keep talking about collaborating, but I think it's time to actually do it and take action. So uh, great comment, thank you. Anyone else want to jump in? I see another 
Please, go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. Thank you for, for the space. I'm Fernando, I'm a researcher from Brazil. And my, my comment, and actually question, goes in the way to question exactly how to put enforcement in enforcing human rights and enforcing uh, the SDGs to companies. Right now, we had a really big scandal uh, of the, uh, de data collecting, and we had a scandal of Cambridge Analytica, and until today, we hadn't have really s substantial actions against these companies. And they were fostering cells that were harming human rights, were against human rights. Because when you see a company that breaches human, basic human rights, we had NGOs reporting, we have uh, like mining, uh, we have reports that actually show the breaches in human rights, but when it's uh, internet and a digital, it's not tangible. So my questions and comments go in the sense to try to understand on how we can held accountable these kinds of companies that can breach uh, human rights and hamper the progress to SDGs and hamper uh, basic, uh, like one of the SDGs of peace and progress and peace and justice. So that's my actually comment and uh, kind of food for thought. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Fernando. Luis, you were gonna jump in, and then Alexandria. So, um, <clears throat> from my side, um, a couple of things. So, you're raising the same issue that I, I raised previously. So, we need uh, to ensure uh, trust and responsibility. So, companies take responsibility to ensure trust with people. Uh, what we have been doing in JESSE, in the Global Enabling Sustainability Initiative, we have been uh, studying uh, and analyzing these issues quite thoroughly. Uh, we just published a report called Enabling Rights, where we looked into all different technologies and how technologies can help to address those issues. And just recently in New York, we, we gathered a group of stakeholders uh, together with us, uh, Oxfam, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, to discuss with business how to address those challenges. And uh, actually, we are working on a solution, hopefully. Um, but this is an initiative from the industry. But there are other dimensions that need also to, to happen. So from a policy standpoint, uh, policy makers, they need to address the, the issue as well. Companies themselves, and then, and then, let's say, business associations in collaboration with the civil society uh, to to work on on the solutions. We, we have, a, a, let's say, we have a platform called Innovators Network for Human Rights, where we publish solutions that can help human rights activists to address challenges in their own activities, in supply chains, workers' rights, and so on and so on. Okay, thank you, Luis. Uh, Alexandria, before I come to you, there's an online uh, comment or question. If we could take that first and then, because perhaps you'll have something to say on that. Please, can we hear from the person online? Go ahead. Yes, if we can transfer the speaker to the remote queue. Thanks. Sure. Please go ahead. If you can introduce yourself and state your question or comment. Technology doesn't fail us. <laughs> uh, Benjamin, we can't hear you. Can we read out his question or comment? I'll ask him to post the question and then I'll read it. Okay, so perhaps we'll, we'll come back to, to Benjamin. Alexandria. Sure. Um, I just wanted to quickly uh, lift up some examples that relate to sort of both the idea of how we collaborate, but then also specifically what does it look like to have accountability. Um, so the first is I wanted to um, make sure folks were aware of the Global Network Initiative. It's a decade-long initiative of companies, socially responsible investors, human rights, civil society, um, 
And the goal of this multi-stakeholder effort is to help companies ensure that they are respecting human rights in the way that we are um, doing business. And there are important learnings that take place in the setting, as well as there is an independent accountability mechanism and assessment. And so this is one example of what we've done in the industry to help companies learn over the course of a decade um, how we can start to address some of these problems and where mitigations need to happen um, in our product, in our policies, and in our public policy. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to also sort of reiterate the point about the UN Guiding Principles Framework. Ultimately, what that means is that there is a responsibility on behalf of governments to ensure that they are creating environments for companies to, to um, innovate responsibly, and then companies have a responsibility to respect human rights. And so that means that companies need to be implementing mechanisms like human rights impact assessments, ongoing human rights due diligence, um, and other activities to ensure that we are um, being thoughtful about the ways in which we're launching products into the world. Similarly, governments have an, ob an obligation to engage with companies and ensure that they're doing that, or use soft and hard law mechanisms to otherwise make sure that happens. So I think that also gets to other aspects of accountability. Olamidi, and then I'll turn to you, Melissa and Miguel, please. Thank you very much. I, I think that your question or your comment reiterates what was said yesterday about um, protection of human rights online as a shared responsibility. So that is the data subject, that is the data collector, that is data processor, and we all have liabilities and we have responsibilities under various laws and regulations. The GDPR provides for remedies for data subjects whose rights have been violated. And there are mechanisms for enforcement and for compensation under the GDPR. I understand Brazil also has a data protection law. So it is um, a shared responsibility. Speaking from the perspective of a lawyer, it's a shared responsibility from all of us, especially the data subjects, to call the data controllers and the data processors to question any time that he's an allegation of violation of rights or privacy or whatever right is provided under the law. Once we all take up the responsibility and we move away from the realm of talking, like she said, just talking and talking, but we take actions, I think, I think it's even easier in developed countries for some companies to sit up than some developing countries from where I come from. And we even still take them to court. And sometimes, most times, we get compensation. Thank you. Melissa. So my, my comment is not necessarily going to address bad actors, but I think that there is a responsibility that you know, we all have when it comes to um, utilizing the technology in front of us. You know, I see around the world um, many, many different definitions of what it means to be digitally literate. Even in certain countries, there are different um, philosophies on what should be taught and what should people be learning when it comes to um, becoming digitally intelligent. And this is where I think it's really important to have a wheel of competencies that people are learning when they go online and understand when you're sharing bits and pieces of data, what are the things that could happen with that data? And what are the risks associated with it? Thank you. Uh, Vice Minister, please. Just to address the first question that the woman I can't see anymore uh, said, I, I think of uh, doing something as countries we are already doing uh, and working collaboratively. I, I think uh, our participation here is this gathering makes us think differently and go back to our countries and do things differently. Uh, me, myself, I saw things differently before coming to these type of gatherings and listening to others, just listening to others from other countries, uh, policymakers that are doing things differently than we think. And this is uh, also a very big step towards uh, doing things right. So I think and applause again for this type of invitation that we're doing. Excellent, thank you, Giza. Very quickly, um, Every country has laws as we all know it. And every, oh, well, I would say every country now have legislation on human rights. So every company, every organization operating within that country must abide within those laws. The problem comes when the owners of businesses don't reside within the country. 
for example, over-the-top technologies. So how do you tax the owners of WhatsApp and Viber and all those other over-the-top technologies? That is the challenge. And the uh, Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization, we did a study on, of OTT. And if there's anybody here from Uganda, um, you'll know that Uganda has, had, uh, has done and passed legislation on OTT. And if they can share their experience um, at some stage of this panel, it would be really, really good. But the key issue is the operators are not getting anything out of it because people go to where there's free Wi-Fi and use the, the, these uh, apps. The government is not getting a cent out of it because if the operator doesn't get um, any money from um, the uh, over-the-top technologies, then the, the government misses out on the tax. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Giza. Are we able to get Benjamin to intervene directly, or can we read out his comment or question? We will try once more, and then I'll read out the question. We actually have two questions from the remote participants. Okay, I know we're almost uh, out of time for this first but, segment, but... Okay, Benjamin, can you talk? Hello. Yes, hello. hello. We can hear you, Benjamin. Please go ahead. My, my name is Benjamin Akimoyeje, and I'm a student researcher in Namibia. Uh, in terms of achieving the SDGs with the internet, this is my view that um, I, I feel is always missing around um, internet governance conversation. For every time we talk about internet, I think we should have a thematic reasons, like if we want improvement in health, why don't we put health forward and say, how can we use internet to enhance health? In that way, we could easily reach out to as many persons as possible using internet. And in this way, I think we can easily address a lot of the SDG goals if we make the thematic area, say access, say education, and all of these other subjects because internet is not internet for internet's sake. Internet is for a particular purpose. That is where I stand, and I think that is the argument I'm still missing when we make internet the priority as against other subject matters that could drag. Okay, the audio cut, but Benjamin, if you're still listening, I think we well understood your comment, and frankly, personally, uh, I couldn't, couldn't agree more with you. Um, I do uh, think that sometimes it, there's a need to sort of shift the conversation and look very specifically, uh, as you were saying, not just internet for internet's sake, but internet for healthcare, internet for education, uh, and look very concretely at the great examples out there, because there's tons of them, uh, where countries and companies and civil society are actually using technology to tackle each and every one of the SDGs. So um, thank you, thank you for that, for that good comment. And was there one more as well? Uh, yes, from we, our, we have yeah. one more question from advocate Jean-Philippe. Please. I can read it uh, quickly. Uh, Following section three of the high-level panel report addressing some dangers of the internet, especially for children, we would be happy to ask the panel how it considers a UN International Human Rights Convention against the dangers of the internet as proposed by the international expert, Rabbi Shalom Arush. Okay, thank you. Um, would I get any comments from my panelists on that? I think the, the point from Benjamin was, was well understood. Anyone want to uh, take up the point on child online safety? Uh, Melissa. So, uh, you know, for me, I think, um, you know, obviously if you've noticed a common theme to everything I say, uh, or everything I've said so far, and that's around digital skills. And this is where I think it's, you know, equally critical for young people 
as they're getting connected and as they may not have you know, supervision around them for them to understand what it means to be safe online. Now, I'm not 100% you know, connected to this particular um, publication, so I'm not gonna you know, go into specific detail because I don't have them, but I can say generally speaking, as we're bringing our kids online, they need to understand both the um, benefits and the dangers. Okay, thank you for that. Um, as many of you may know, that we've been talking about a lot of anniversaries, the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the anniversary of the uh, creation of the World Wide Web. Last week, it was also the anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And there have been a number of discussions happening in the UN as well as outside the UN on um, the uh, scary numbers out there in terms of uh, online harassment, bullying, and even um, sexual abuse and exploitation online. So much to be done in that space, which is worrisome. Uh, on the ITU side, we're working with a number of you in the revamp of our child online protection guidelines. Uh, and we would invite you to, to be part of that exercise if you're not already engaged. I think, Giza, if I, I knew you wanted to make a comment, yes. maybe you can hold it, and so, is that okay? Because uh, we're gonna come back at the end for some general comments and reflections. So now moving from people to planet, uh, we're gonna shift here for a moment. And um, as, you, as you probably know, the SDGs did set a goal to protect the planet uh, so it can support the needs of present and future generations. Uh, every day we're seeing just how how connected and how fundamental climate change is to uh, global development. And of course, digital technologies have a very critical role to play uh, in protecting the planet and helping to reverse negative trends. Um, we're gonna be focusing on uh, a range of, of SDGs from clean water to clean energy, responsible consumption, a life below water, life on land, and also climate action. Uh, and I'm gonna start first with, uh, with you, Luis. Uh, as I mentioned, Luis is the, the CEO of, of Jesse. And Luis, if you can uh, share with us, I know you have uh, a couple of slides that you wanted to just show briefly, uh, how digital technologies can be most impactful in the fight against climate change. Luis, please. Uh, thank you, Doreen. I will try to, to stick to my five minutes. Um, and uh, I mentioned to you previously that we, we did a, a substantial piece of research um, which turned to be this report, Digital with Purpose, Delivering a Smarter 2030. Um, I invite you to spend one month to read it. It's a 500-page report. Um, it uh, has more than 500 case studies that we analyzed. Uh, as I said, 2,000 uh, pages or documents of research. And uh, we looked into seven different technologies from digital access, 5G, IoT, digital reality, blockchain, cloud, cognitive, so I mean uh, advanced analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and fast internet. So we correlated all these technologies with the sustainable development goals. Uh, and um, uh, we had an incredible group of uh, recognized people, people like uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, Christian Figueres, and others, Georg Kell, the former UN uh, Global Compact Director, <clears throat> between many others that supported our research. An amazing group of technology companies helping us as well uh, within the JASI framework. And this chart that probably you cannot read from the distance summarizes very much what we have done. So we looked into all the different SDGs, and uh, we came to the conclusion that these technologies can impact in a positive manner 103 of the 169 SDGs. A, a, a strong positive impact and a strong correlation. So we did impact assessment, quantitative assessment, and then we came to the conclusions around what are the most relevant impacts, but also we analyzed what we call the externalities. And so from a positive story, uh, we, we, we saw that uh, technologies will be creating growth, they will have a positive impact uh, on employment. Um, from a negative perspective, we came to the conclusion that we need to address issues like greenhouse gas emissions, 
or e-waste or what we call sustainable consumption or unsustainable consumption. Uh, I already mentioned that the SDGs, so the technologies will have a positive impact by 2030. Uh, in 22% of the old SDGs, some of the SDGs actually are not going on, on the right side. Uh, our, our study shows that 30% of the SDGs actually are having a negative trend, but technologies can impact 22% of those. On the positive side, those that are going down, they can impact 23% and can avoid that tendency of going down through these technologies. So when it comes to climate change, uh, which is the main purpose of, of this, this panel, uh, what we have been doing in JESSE, we have been analyzing since 2008 what is the situation of technologies in relation to climate change. Around three main questions. One is what is the ICT sector footprint? The other one, what is the enabling capacity of the technologies? And the third question is around the, the business value around it. So in 2008, we did a report called SMART 2020. And the conclusion was that technologies could have an impact 5.5 times bigger, enabling impact, than our own footprint. We did the same exercise in 2012, uh, and the, the, the factor was 1 to 7. We did the same exercise in 2015, and the factor was 1 to 10. So the SMART 2030 report that we did in 2015 concluded that the technologies can bring down 20% of the global emissions. Uh, and this is an amazing story in a business as usual scenario. Our digital with purpose report uh, came to the same conclusion through this number of technologies that I mentioned to you. Actually, this report shows that our footprint in 2030 will be about one gigaton of CO2, while in 2008 it was 1.4 gigatons of CO2. So it seems that the ten tendency is going down, so these are the good news. But that does not mean necessarily that we need to cross our arms, we need to address the challenge. Our companies are investing in uh, uh, green energies, so if you look at uh, what the technology companies are doing, investing in, uh, in green energy, in data centers, in infrastructure, uh, so this is the way that we are walking the talk. But I think the, the most interesting story here is that the more you deploy technology, the more you can help other industry sectors to address climate change. And that will impact every single sector, energy, agriculture, logistics, and so on and so on. So this is just to, to trigger the conversation, and then there will be an, an opportunity to talk probably in more detail during the panel discussion. Thank you so much. Very, very visual, very impactful. I love when you figure out how to measure things because we, when we can start to measure, we can actually start to, to move the needle and make things happen. So I like how you were able to, to link digital to 103 specific targets out of the 169. Thank you, that's excellent. So Giza, turning to you, maybe to, to get your perspective uh, from where the Commonwealth countries sit when we look at uh, ICTs and how uh, we can use digital technologies to facilitate uh, cleaner production and more sustainable agriculture uh, while protecting the environment. Giza, please. Thank you. So when we talk planet, we're talking about the land, the sea, the space, and above all, the people. Now, when you look back in history, the Industrial Revolution, then we can say, wow, we have come a long way. It took the telephone, the fixed telephone line, 150 years to cover every corner of the world, but it took the internet only five years. So this is how powerful technology is. And so in the Commonwealth, what we are doing is we helped our Commonwealth countries develop policies and um, regulation and legislation around the affordable and secure use or an ac and access to information and communication technology or more recently to the digital economy. And there's a huge impact of technology 
in ensuring that um, the world or the co Commonwealth countries, 2.4 billion people, which makes it a third of the world's population. Now, technology helps in agriculture. When you think about the dynamic of people, it's food. Without food, we shouldn't be here. So this is why it's very important because technology can help countries um, look at new ways of making sure that uh, we can uh, grow the food that everybody can, you know, can su um, um, survive on. When you look at the FAO, at the World Bank, and other uh, studies, it says that around 800,000 children don't have access to better food. So this is where technology comes in. I mean, how do we sensitize, how, how can we understand what is happening out there in the rural villages? It has to be technology. And it has to be a combination of uh, uh, terrestrial and also satellite technology. If you think about satellites, it's 100% coverage. And then you also think of the way that um, the governments provide information. This is where digi digital broadcasting come in because that will allow everybody to understand what is happening out there in government. And then of course, our mobile phones. The key here is capacity building. When we first launched the, uh, we first liberalized the market back in my country, Samoa, I was so proud, happy, that I took the first mobile phone to my village. It was for my sister. So I rang my sister in Australia and I told the sister back home, come talk to her, can you hear her voice? She was going, oh, no, she was scared. You know, we took everything for granted. But now, mobile phone is amazing. During that liberalization, we looked at, I was working for the ITU, as uh, Doreen mentioned, we looked at small island developing states in the Caribbean, in the Pacific Island. Then we realized that there's so much to do in these countries because they are so isolated. And yet, there is a lot we can do. And therefore, it, uh, we did a, a project, and that is um, telecenters. I know a lot of the results of many telecenters were negative, but when you take a telecenters out to the rural village and teach women that had never had any education before to use the email, one day you go there and they say, oh, Nisa, uh, look, I got the email from my grandson in Vancouver and he sent photos, but I don't know how to send my photos there. So this is, this is proof that with technology, you don't, have, you don't need an education. And when I said before that these are global solution, um, challenges that need global solutions, the implementation of the global solutions is the key. And this is where we look at governments and we look at our own people. Sometimes we have to rely on us to do what we can. But this is what we're doing um, for the Commonwealth countries is to give them the positive, positiveness of the digital economy. So now everybody is coming in, but the key thing is access. There is still the need for access, and it is where universal um, access funds come in. So currently, the Commonwealth, uh, we're CTO, we're doing the uh, project with Malawi and other Commonwealth countries on universal access. I'll leave it here. Um, we'll comment in another time. Thank you, thank you, Giza. Uh, so, challenges, solutions in the context of planet. Melissa, please. Yeah, one of the things that um, that you that you mentioned was about um, working, you know, working with government on policies. And, you know, I'm going to just recognize a couple of people in the audience that I've been volunteering with on a project for the last year that I think could be interesting. So Mike and Lydia, stand up. Thank you. 
Um, I, I'm recognizing Mike and Lydia. They both work at Microsoft. Um, I'm a former Microsofty, and we have been involved in um, taking 82 broadband policies from around the world and ingesting them into a natural language processing algorithm to identify best practices, identify what's included across a number of broadband policies. And the reason I bring this up is I see a lot of people setting up you know, talking about goals, but how are those making, uh, how are those goals making their way into policies, whether that's gender inclusion, speed, uh, affordability, um, whatever it may be, and how can we drive a more data-driven and objective approach to evolving broadband policies? Um, we actually took all of the data, uh, we put it into a, a Power BI dashboard, so a data visualization tool, and it's all online, so anyone is able to access it. Um, we're in the process of taking all of the policies that we, um, that we collected. We still have more to collect and still more work to do, but anyone that wants to check it out and um, kind of evaluate how can you evolve your broadband policies without reading a hundred of them and figuring out how do you get to a better place, it's at broadbandpolicy.org. Thank you. So Thank you. Melissa Olamidi, please. So talking about uh, solving problems for Commonwealth countries, Nigeria, as we speak, has problems with agriculture, food. Um, if any one of you have been following our situation, in a couple of weeks, we ran out of chicken. So, mm -hmm. so it's, there's an hilarious story of um, an outlet that uh, the business is based on chicken and they couldn't, they couldn't do business because there was no chicken. And, and these, these um, are kind of opportunities for companies, for technology to be, I mean, employed to, to improve agriculture in those kind of countries, like the Commonwealth countries where I understand in some European countries, in some developed countries, you have genetically pro produced um, um, food items. Those could be deployed to Africa, where there is massive, massive problems like that to be solved. So that's what I think. Thank you for that. Other comments for the panel, or can we turn to the room, Giza, and then we're going to see if there's any questions in the room. Yeah. Just quickly, my message to my Commonwealth family is implementation. I always say to them, Great, we have policies, we've developed this and that, but the key is in the implementation. And if you don't do the implementation, then our policies will be sitting in shelves gathering dust. That's my very small, uh, um, strong message out there. And uh, speaking of Nigeria, my uh, really good friend, uh, um, Professor Dambata, used to be the chair of the Telecommun uh, CTO Executive Committee. So we were talking about agriculture and ICTs, and he was quite surprised when I said, well, when you look at an equation, it goes like this, sustainable agriculture equals sustainable lives. Thank you. Thank you, Giza. I see a question back here and another one here at the table. So please, if you could introduce yourself and then go ahead and ask your question or make your comment, please. Thank you. Uh, Sharif from the Maldives, Permanent Secretary of Science and Technology Ministry. So it was very interesting to hear the panel. Um, two things uh, that I note from the panel. Connectivity is fundamental and key to achieving SDGs. Next, 30% of SDG achievement is on the negative, on the decline, right? So given that we just discussed the first two Ps, right, and not to be on the negative side of technology. In, in the Maldives, both these Ps are extremely important. The planet matters to us because we are the smallest part of the planet. We are in crisis, right? But before that, we are in a connectivity crisis. We, in fact, have very good connectivity with the world, albeit um, at very high cost, but we have over 80% broadband mobile penetration. But on the positive side, our development has actually seen 
the positive impacts. But on the people side, what we see is we are actually an island nation of over 187 very tiny micro communities. And these communities tend to be fairly homogeneous. And we have from the past maybe not had the kind of diversity that we would really want. And we thought maybe connected to the rest of the world, we would get this diversity, the strength of diversity, which will accelerate our development. But we find in reality, connecting to the rest of the world, we start living in even smaller bubbles. Now we forget the huge oceans between the islands. We create bubbles with people in New York, people in Europe, and then what happens? the small diversity we already have in our tiny islands are lost. And we create these small islands of even more homogeneity, mm -hmm. which may really be one factor. Just to take one example, the example of anti-vaxxers. We have tremendous achievement in achieving the goals in terms of health, but imagine opening up ourselves to the world and learning that there are people out there who are ready to connect and be on the same small island in the internet who don't believe in vaccination. So not just us, but I think many parts of the world we are seeing going back into the past in some of these SDGs. So this is one thing. The other thing is when we look at technology in the bigger countries, Going electric may help, but in a country where we have to import diesel to make electric, increasing the number of electric vehicles may itself have its own challenges. So we have to actually very critically look at the footprint of introducing accelerated technologies where the technology Ex uh, introduction is not matching the rate of the increase of the number of renewable energy that we are able to create along with it. So that we end up importing more and more diesel fuel. So these are some of the challenges in the two piece that I just wanted to highlight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sharif. And we also have a comment here at the table and I see one other one in the back and then I think we have this, no, nothing online. Okay, so please, at the table. Yeah, my name is Anke Domscheid berg I'm uh, MP of the German Parliament, specialized on internet policy. Um, I would like to come back to what uh, Giza said, because we often talk about providing infrastructure, technical access, and then the need of educating in terms of literacy, but I think very often a third component is missing and that is relevant content. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is, how can we become better in providing the right content to help people help themselves? Databases, for example, with freely, freely downloadable, downloadable printing files uh, where you can immediately print water pipe adapters when you only have two not fitting water pipes and no construction market where you can just buy the fitting ones or tools or replacement parts to fix things which are broken and um, then there are little apps where you can for example calculate if the roof of your building uh, would be good enough for rainwater harvesting it's sometimes really simple stuff but how do you develop the right things how do you make them available how do you get people to know this um, I just remember another example. There's an app called Plantix, has been developed by German students, but adapted to other continents too, where you need a smartphone. It's probably already um, a barrier, but if you have it, you can just um, show an, a diseased plant to the camera, and then it's analyzing it with artificial intelligence, and it's telling you what the likely reason for this plant disease is and how you can treat it naturally without needing to buy some poison from some shop. And um, I think connecting this content also to production tools, 
democratizing tools of production like 3D printers, maker spaces, teaching people how to fix and build stuff themselves in rural areas is a real key to development. And I would like to know uh, what you know about these examples, what, what is being done and how we can become better. Excellent, great question. So relevant content, I would also add in local languages as well, because the language is also often an issue. So there was one other, please, the gentleman in the back there, and then I'll come quickly back to my panel for some quick uh, reflections, please, sir. Yeah, thank you. My name is Saad Amal Mufashi. I'm a freelance journalist, I'm a fellow with the Reporters Without Borders Berlin Scholarship Program. My question is about ensuring governmental action, especially in areas where there is little political will or action vis-a-vis -vis implementing the SDGs, especially for digital access. I'll start with food security, where you find rural farmers in northern Nigeria, where I am from, having access to technology, for example, with support from Google, to have access to quality seeds for crop production, but yet cannot transport their produce to the markets in the cities due to lack of access to proper road transport, which is basically a failure of government. Also, going back a bit about the discussion on SDGs and people, where you have a total isolation in the collaborative action, Google or the UN might provide digital tablets for internet access to students or girls in schools, but then you find these students with gadgets studying in schools without a roof or under the shade of a tree or walking long distances just to go to school with a shiny tablet in their backpack. So how do we ensure, especially in developing countries, that governments also share their end of the bargain in providing conducive environments to ensure proper digital access? Thank you. Excellent question, thank you, <laughs> Saidama. Okay, so we got uh, three comments there from the Maldives, from Germany, and from our, our friend, I didn't get which country you were from, but you were journalist, Saidama. Nigeria. Nigeria, thank you. Okay, so any uh, quick uh, comments? Melissa, we start with you and go down yeah, the line, please. Sure, um, so I wanna comment on um, your question, um, our friend from Germany. Um, so. Outside of my, my, my role at IBM, um, I have my, my own company that I run. Um, I'm mainly working in Tunisia, so I'll give you an example of um, what I've done uh, personally with my team in Tunisia. I focus on underserved communities and actually teaching them digital literacy, but also teaching them how to code. And part of that is empowering them to create their own solutions. So me not creating a solution for them, but them creating their own solutions. And what I mean by that is I have run, you know, I've taught tens of thousands of kids to code in t about 12 different countries through my program. In Tunisia, it's partly funded by the US Department of State. Um, our flagship camp, we run for 30 days. Young people come in without any experience coding. They learn how to build a mobile application. Um, they learn how to, in some cases, it kind of depends on the camp, combine that with a IoT solution or a robotic solution. I have a co-working space um, in, the, in the capital. And what we do is we bring in uh, 30 young people from across the country, and they spend a month in the sleepover camp. They come up with a challenge. They tie it to the SDGs, and they look at what is a business challenge that we're having in our own community? What's the data that backs that up? So they learn media literacy. What's valuable data that they can use to make business decisions? They come up with the audience. They come up with the business model. They do demo days. We invite technology professionals, business professionals to come in and um, help them with their pitches. And at the end, they win a prize. And then we nurture those ideas over time. So I don't think it's about how can you know, one person from another country come and create solutions for you. People have to move from being uh, consumers of technology into creators, makers, and doers empowered by technology. But it's not just technology, it's business skills, it's soft skills and everything that goes along with that. On the meeting, please. R responding to my Nigeria brother, um, I think it, we'll be asking for too much if someone is giving us some form of aid. Maybe Google is providing the, 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 the tablets or they're providing the device and we still expect them to fix our roads. That might just be asking for too much or asking for the impossibility. Now we've had situations in the past where some students were studying in dilapidated classrooms and um, some organizations gave them some um, tablets, some um, mobile phones, and we've seen 
situations where they have used such devices to post the state of their schools on the internet, on social media, and I discovered that in some of the cases, the government responded because of the backlash. So this is where we talk about the shared responsibility. Someone has decided to give us a device. We, as the citizens, we also have a, a role to play uh, to call our governments to, account, to, be, to be accountable and to call them to perform their duties and responsibilities under the law. So I think we all have responsibilities. One party cannot, cannot finish all. So we all have our shared responsibilities. So that's it. Thank you. And maybe just to, to add to what you were saying and to, to, to the friend in the back from, from Nigeria um, and, and your point about ensuring government action on the SDGs, I would just underscore the importance of, of political will. And, and I think that that's key, that governments really do need to be committed to the SDGs. And I think we need to do a better job even here in the IGF community and elsewhere of ensuring that governments understand the importance of connectivity and the importance of digital in each and every SDG. And I don't think we're quite there yet. I've seen myself in the context of the UN high-level political forum when countries do their voluntary national reviews and they talk about how they're implementing and achieving the SDGs. I think about 30% of the countries that reported this year mentioned ICTs, which means the link's not there yet. I think all of us need to do a better job in, in, really, in really pushing that. And I also wanted to just quickly come back to uh, Sharif from, from the Maldives. You raised some points that came up on day zero and I think also yesterday. Um, and when we think about the theme of one world, one net, and one vision, um, I do think uh, you brought up some good points about ensuring that we maintain also diversity. Uh, we, we remember uh, culture, local culture, local context, uh, and I think that we, we have to remember to, to be preserving those as well. So thank you also for, for raising some of those points. Giza, you were going to make a, a quick comment? Yes. I. Uh, what my comment is about the uh, the question by uh, Germany. I um, I was working with the ITU, and one of the projects we did, uh, as I mentioned before, is telecenters. And what we found that worked was developing a how-to in the local language, and that was how a lot of the young young girls who have not uh, had the opportunity to attend colleges and also the women came together and they learned, and that's how um, um, that um, worked. But I'm thinking back now, that was like 2005, and it, the internet was dial-up, can you imagine? So they were sitting there waiting, and, and the training too was delivered in the local language. I think that's really, really important. And then the other project that I did uh, for the ITU, um, was on climate change. It was a, an early warning system for flooding in, in, the, um, in Uganda, in Butaleja, East Uganda. So with that project, again, because of my experience from the Telecenter project in Samoa, I met with UCC and the way we did it was they developed training in the local language which was uh, also done and it's sensitization. So, and then when we developed the system, I asked them, give me instructions in the local language. So when the, f the siren goes in the first time, you tell them, okay, there is likely to be flooding, uh, to be um, floods. And then the second one, they will say in the local language, pack and go. And then the third one, it will say, stay if you want to die. And when we launched this project, it was amazing because flood happened before the launch. And, and then by the time we launched, when the flooding happened before, it was the first time ever not one person died. So it all goes back. And I'm, I'm referring to my colleague uh, from uh, Maldives, I strongly believe that within the challenges we face, there is a lot of new skills that we need to give our people to stay sustainable in everything we do. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Kiza. Uh, I know there's further comments, but we're going to move now to the last part of our discussion, and then we'll come back uh, for those of you that didn't get to jump in. Uh, we're now going to switch to the third P, which is prosperity. Um, the SDGs aim to ensure that all human beings can enjoy prosperous and fulfilling lives, um, and to ensure that economic, social, and technological progress occurs in harmony with nature. Uh, digital technologies have a critical role to play in enabling inclusive growth and sustainable societies. Um, Melissa, I'm going to turn to you. Of course, in the context of the SDGs, we're thinking about sort of the future uh, work, decent work agenda, uh, SDG 9 around industry, and of course, reducing inequalities. Uh, if you can share with us sort of your thoughts in that space and how digital technologies uh, can help foster a more sustainable, more equal, and fairer world. Please, Melissa. So, Speaking of a fair world, before I, I answer the question, um, I, I'd like to tell you a story. I'd like to tell you a story about Zahra, Zahran, and Yumna. Zahra, Zahran, and Yumna were three, five, and seven. And this was 10 years ago. They were picked up at their school, and they were taken to another country where they live to this day. My name's Melissa Sassi. And I'm the mother of Zahra, Zahran, and Yumna. They still live in this country. We're victims of parental kidnapping. For me, internet inclusion, digital inclusion, meaningful internet, is me being a mother. When Doreen Stant stood up there and she said, meaningful connectivity, for me, I thought, what, is, what does that mean to all of us? And for me, it means being a mother, because I'm a mother from afar. Now, don't worry. They're safe. They're healthy. I know where they are. And this is what has empowered um, me to kind of focus on what I think is my life's work, and that's digital inclusion. So I'm the um, chair of the IEEE Digital Intelligence Working Group, and I'm in the process of working through um, the IEEE, the IEEE Smart Village, and the Coalition for Digital Intelligence. You can find that at coalitionfordigitalintelligence.org. And why I'm mentioning this and why I'm mentioning my personal connection is because in order to gain prosperity, it is personal. It's not just about what does Google think, what does IBM think, what does the ITU think, what do all of our respective organizations think. It's what does that mother in the Maldives think which I love the Maldives, by the way, and I will absolutely come back there anytime. <laughs> um, you know, what does Zahra, Zahran, and Yumna think? When I noticed that they did not have access to technology in their classroom, I created a program to send 400 computers there, which empowered me to kind of think about what does it mean to be digitally intelligent. And I realized there were thousands of different frameworks and definitions and tutorials out there, many lacking local language content, and so I thought, what could I do to make the world a better place? So I pulled together a team at the IEEE, um, and we uh, worked with the standards board. I spent two years doing a literature review, identifying all of the different frameworks and definitions of what it means to be digitally intelligent. Right now, we're going through the IEEE's standardization board, which has 400,000 members worldwide, the largest engineering organization on the planet to standardize what does it mean to be digitally literate. When you go into school, when you go into informal education, everybody has a different, different definition of what this means. Again, you can find the competencies at the uh, website that I just mentioned. In my mind, these are both the basic skills, the intermediary skills, as well as the advanced skills. So see it as kind of like a wheel of competencies. In order to gain, whether it's increasing healthcare outcomes, whether it's increasing education outcomes, or increasing economic outcomes, or being a mother. It's this wheel of competencies. And what you'll see on that wheel of competencies once you go to that website is, it's not just about how do I learn how to code, not everybody's gonna be an engineer, but how do I keep myself safe online? How do I collaborate online? What is the emotional intelligence that goes into collaborating online? 
but also how do you take that group of people who really have a passion for that wheel of competencies and I've been able to get it down to 31 hours in a classroom setting or you know a train the trainer kind of thing in my in in my implementation work so it's not just talking theoretically about what's possible but going out and making this possible I also think about one other thing 258 million young people are outside of the school system what are we doing to empower those young people in an informal way? How can we use technology to teach them to read, to teach them to write, and is there another role that technology can pay to put them into decent work? I do a lot of work in Pakistan where the second largest number of people reside, and I'm very interested in what work we could all do together to bring young people into a position where they are able to prosper. Unless we have a common framework of what it means to be digitally intelligent, we don't have a way of measuring progress. Thank you, thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you for, for sharing your, your story. Um, very, very moving, and we feel your passion, and you're doing lots of great things in this space, so thank you. Uh, Olamidi, I'm going to turn to you and, and perhaps you could share with us and enlighten us on the experience in, in Nigeria and things that have been happening in your country in the space of uh, enabling access to fair education and, and decent work. Please. Thank you very much. Once again, I'm going to start by thanking you for inviting me at least to hear the Nigerian part of the whole thing. So. Uh, if I had so much time, I would have gone around the all asking us one after the other what we understand by fair education. I'm so sure the way a Nigerian man is going to define fair education would not be the same way someone from the UK would define it. I'm so sure if I ask Melissa what she understands by fair education, it would be completely different from my own understanding of fair education. I'm a lawyer and I've been so qualified for about 12 years, but with the benefit of hindsight, would I say I have or I had a fair education? My answer might, might just um, not be what some of you would expect. So talking about the situation of Nigeria, as you speak on fair education and how technology could help, the part of the country I'm going to focus on will be the northern part. That is with respect the most less educated part we have a whole lot, a whole lot of children out of school. They had never been to school. They don't know what school is. And um, in the past 10 years, they had, we had insurgency in Nigeria. The northern part was ravaged with terrorism. A lot of families were displaced. A lot of children are displaced as we speak. They reside in IDP camps what we call internally displaced persons camps, and um, they do not have access to education. But recently, we've had some um, aids coming their ways, internally and externally. So I have a couple of um, examples. In 2006, the federal government, the Federal Ministry of Education, launched an ICT-driven technology. It's a project that's online, that, that has the curriculum, basic curriculum for students, for ch young children who are not in school, for them to be able to learn. And um, also in um, Yola, another state in, I mean, a, a city in Adamawa State, another northern state, um, another organization, a foreign organization, gave students, gave pupils, gave young children laptops with preloaded content. So in Nigeria, when you talk about education for the young people, the first thing you talk about is their learning of alphabets, English alphabets. So the, the, um, the applications have preloaded content for mathematics, for arithmetics, basic arithmetics, and English learning, and maybe some part of social studies from where they could start learning without necessarily going through the uh, four walls of, a, of a, I mean, the classroom, the regular classroom. So uh, someone mentioned the fact that technology is making us see education in a different light. It's, it's, it is not what it used to be where people would necessarily have to be within the four walls of the classroom. So with laptops that my brother mentioned, 
children can learn. And that has been the experience in Nigeria for a while. So talking about decent work as well, so that is also relative. What is decent in some part of the world is not decent in Nigeria. And what is decent in our own situation is not decent in your own situation. I was in Amsterdam a couple of days ago and I spoke with a startup. The startup is a legal startup. They, for them to employ, for them to retain, for them to engage locals in, in Amsterdam, it could cost them close to, say, 500, 1,000 um, euros in a month. But whereas, I'm not so happy to say this, but this is the reality. They engaged some lawyers in Nigeria and they were giving them about 300 euros, 500 euros. And trust me, to the caliber of the lawyers employed, engaged in Nigeria, that is decent. Because unfortunately, an average lawyer in Nigeria doesn't end well. So when you find someone that is going to retain you, or that's going to engage you, you sit in the comfort of your room, all you need to do has to be on the system, then technology has helped to create a decent, decent um, work for, for, those, for those kind of people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to turn back to the panel for some quick reflections and then over to the audience. Luis, please. Um, well, the, this panel is about growth, right? Uh, <laughs> so, um, now, it's clear, and uh, I showed it, showed it before, that uh, digital technologies will be having a positive impact across the global economy. So, the, you know, the, the numbers are, are huge. We're, we're talking uh, in, uh, in trillions of um, US dollars in, in, uh, in benefits by 2030. Um, and uh, I also, let's say, more or less made clear from the research that we have done that technology will be having a positive impact uh, ac across the world. Uh, coming from a, a business initiative, uh, my, I have a main concern. Is My concern is how are we addressing the negatives? So how can we move the needle whereby the negatives turn to become positives? And I think that's where we need to put our strengths. So if you deploy technology in a given country or in a given environment, you see immediately things going well. Because once you have connectivity, you provide access to education, to, to different tools for health, uh, for connectivity, for mobility, for, uh, for the business environment, logistics, whatever you can think of, ag agriculture, and so on. So you see immediately things moving in the right direction. But we need to take into account that we need to address the externalities. Uh, and by externalities, I mean the critical areas, which are the most crucial areas from now on to 2030. And uh, if you look at how the world is moving and the impact of technologies in the global environment, you see three things that we need to, to pay greater attention. One is the digital divide. So we see more and more people having access than the others. So we have a huge number of people without access. And those that have access, they also live much better than the ones that have not access. So there is a role for policymakers to make sure to create a balance in, in, in the world through the use of, of, of technologies. The, the other thing that we need to address is the overall issue around uh, human rights, privacy, and security. This is becoming an extremely critical area that we need to, to, to understand because this might impact in the global um, stability of the planet. And we, you know, I, I don't want to go into very much detail, but if you, if you follow the discussions in the US and the, now in the UK with the elections and the Brexit and so on, you see how technology is misused in terms of uh, destabilizing also the, the, the environment and democracy and the institutions and so on. So we, we need to look into those areas because these will impact in our global situation across the world. Uh, I want to bring this into the, the conversation uh, just to stress that while I'm a firm believer that technology will be fundamental for a better world, in order to make sure that this better world will happen, we need to pay a lot of attention to some critical areas that also technology can 
you know, have a negative impact. Uh, I, I was listening to the, to the question from the German MP, and for me, the, the main question that she was raised, probably I misunderstood that, uh, uh, not, not well, but it's mainly about the digital divide because it's about how do we ensure that we provide the information to everybody? How do we make sure that everybody has, has access to the information? How do we bring to the schools the tools for the kids, for them to learn? Because we still live in a dual system. We have the privilege with access, and we have the others without access. And so the, the main question here, and I'll go back to my previous comment, is that we need to provide universal access to communication. We need connectivity overall, and that requires investments, that requires policy. And, and when it comes to privacy and security, or, or, or freedom of expression, or human rights, there are two main things that we need to ensure when it comes to technology, is ethics, ethics, ethics. We need to go to the basics, to the values. If we abide by the values, we will solve the challenges that we have with technology. Excellent, thank you. I see already we have a question, but did any, please? Just a small reflection related on what the German MP said also. It, it's very important to note that internet by itself gives information and very chances to uh, develop a country, right? But there's a story that happened in, in, in Paraguay where we just left a computer with an internet connection in a very vulnerable uh, rural area. And stayed there for months and they only used it as we taught them to send emails for uh, communicate each other which is something good but uh, there was a american peace corps volunteer that once visit that visited that community and he saw that people were having uh, the community had a problem health problem because they cooked inside their houses in small houses right using carbon so he called the leader and told him, uh, look up in, inter in this internet page, you could see how you could cook better with this oven that we could make here in your community. So they built it and uh, all of the houses also built that chimney, chimney with their own uh, uh, tools. And what happened was great because they solved the community problem using internet connection and uh, it was impressive. So what is content? Content uh, information is not knowledge, but when someone can help you use that information and turn it into knowledge, something great happens. And uh, I just want to tell that, that story, what we saw. That's a great story, thank you. Okay, I see two questions, please. Gentlemen over here, if you could state your name and go ahead. Thank you. My name is Marcel Dorsch. I'm a researcher at the German Advisory Council on Global Change, and we also just published a 500-page report towards our common digital future, where we think about sustainability issues in the digital age. And I also want to just broaden the picture a little bit uh, more and to challenge the panel. Uh, the Agenda 2030 says in the headline, Transforming Our World. What we actually see with digital change is a massive massive economically driven disruption through digital change in many areas not sustainable at all yet. So digital change in its transformative power was not really anticipated in the 2030 agenda, I would say, and it's a real challenge and, of course, opportunity to bring these communities together and to think about positive outcomes and solutions. However, of course, three points. We need to give digital change a purpose. That's very much appreciated. Um, its many tools are no end in itself, right? They are instruments. And uh, we need to make digital technology itself more sustainable with regards to energy use, but also about new resource problems, for example, so rare earth metals, etc. However, third, and uh, this is a little bit missing on the panel yet, when uh, thinking about really like digital leverages uh, with a towards the agenda 2030, we also need to, uh, to think a little bit more systemically about problems. Digital technologies support renewable energy use, decentralized, etc., but they also could, for example, support the development of new oil fields, let's say. Digital technologies can create inclusion and new opportunities for the Global South, 
but they, with backshoring, for example, could also change our world order completely and create more injustice. Digital technologies can enrich our democratic practice substantially, but also bring totalitarian rule. Think about social scoring in parts of China or huge imbalances with regards to um, tech monopolists. So this is my question to the panel. Um, how can we and should we redirect digital change as a strong means towards sustainable uh, development globally? Also maybe within the UN, the ITU has maybe some leverages with regard to data politics. I think this is a real substantial issue which has to be addressed in the context of the UN and of course the political environment matters a lot, right? The non-digital uh, 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 framework conditions. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you for those comments. I think there's a gentleman in the back here. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Santiago. I come from Colombia. Um, I am the director of uh, Innovation Lab uh, for the city of Bogota. Um, I used to uh, work for an agency that deploys and gives computers for every single school uh, in, in Colombia, even in rural areas. And now, 10 years have passed and we haven't improved even a point uh, in, in, the measure, in the measurement of the quality of education. Um, as a politician at that time, I give a promise when I give a computer to a school that everything is gonna be is, is gonna be different. We're gonna be different. But but now I have to to say that it wasn't real. From that point onwards, I started to try to understand uh, different digital divides because the digital divide is not if I have internet or if I have to if I know how to use it. But we discovered seven different digital divides. The speed, for, for instance, is a very important one. The speed of the connectivity. But there are two that, are, that concern me the most. One is the divide or the intention gap. The difference between the intention of, our, of for instance, a rich person in a city, the intention to use the internet um, of that people and the people in rural areas, for instance. Um, both, can, both can use Facebook, but with totally different intentions. Some of them are selling goods there, and some of them are just sometimes loser day times watching other people's lives and even feel, feeling frustrated. Uh, so we try to measure this intention, and we create the, a kind of a genie uh, a Gini measure, a Gini for the inequality of, uh, in the internet. And this Gini is even more, uh, I, mean, I mean, it's worse than the Gini and the inequality in the real world or in the 2.0 world. Which is, I mean, we are really preoccupied about this. And the second uh, gap we call the Matthew effect. The Matthew effect is a concept that uh, was proven by a professor saying that if you know how to read, and then uh, you can learn something else in a, in a, in a fastly pace. If you don't know how, how to read or you, you read poorly, you're gonna improve your knowledge in everything, but you're gonna improve it uh, just a little bit. It happens the same with the internet. If two different people uh, are in the same starting point, but with different com uh, competitive advantages, the internet is going to provide differently to them. If you know, if you are, I mean, if you know a second language, for for example, in Colombia, if you know how to speak in English, so your internet is totally different. Uh, in, com in, com in 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 I mean, comparing with the internet, if you don't know how to speak in English. Uh, so, bilingualism is a, is a, I mean, is a factor that differentiates the way you use the internet. If you have a bank account and credit card, it's totally different. If you don't have it, the internet is just very small for you. You cannot access 
to the payment walls for the, the content that are produced in the universities, for instance. Or if you, uh, if you had a bad or a bad quality primary school, so you don't have the ability to formulate a clever question to get better information, so the internet is going to be really different for you. So we call this the Matthew effect. Uh, my comments, my, my question is uh, how to solve this divide? Thank you, and apologies to, to cut you short because those are very, very important comments. We do have, I think, one uh, comment from a remote participant. Please go ahead. Yes, we, we have a question from Benjamin from Namibia. Okay. He's going to try Thanks. again. Okay, Benjamin. Okay, uh, hello. So this is Benjamin again. Um, my question, closing question to, to the panel, panelists will be, um, is it possible to have um, the big techs, those who drive technology, who are driven by innovation and economic reasons to make the internet big and all of the innovations around internet at the table as well? I mean, my question is, every time we have conversation in IGF, it's all about developing countries, the demand for um, reaching the unreached, the rural. But I'm asking now, is it also possible to have the big technology companies who are driving innovation, the private sectors, to be at the table as well, in such a way that they could model into their business plans, the unreached, the, the rural dwellers, those uh, who need some of this technology. In that way, as they they get their own big earnings, they can also give something back to up, consider those who don't have access in their innovations and ideas. I'm asking if there's a, a way we can have that kind of conversation so that the, I mean, the big tech companies be at the table as well. I mean, prominently in IGF conversations. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Benjamin. Um, great, uh, great question. So we have, I think, five minutes left. And what I'm going to invite my fellow panelists, if you can respond to, to what you've just heard and also uh, if there's one specific takeaway that you would like to add. Uh, Alexandria, I'm going to maybe start with you as I think you had a question that was actually just for you. Can we bring big tech, I think I would call uh, Google big tech. So um, maybe if you want to take Benjamin's um, question and if you have a specific takeaway you'd like to add and we'll just go straight down the line, please. Sure, we can bookend the question. Yeah, um, IBM in the house. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, absolutely, big companies, companies of all sizes want to be at the table for conversations that happen at IGF. We are a huge supporter of this venue, of these conversations, of multi-stakeholder dialogue about how the internet works and how it develops um, and ensuring that we all have a voice in the way that this, this works. Um, so simple answer, yes. Um, in terms of takeaways, I think that all of the comments that I've heard both from panelists um, and from um, folks in the audience and online, um, I think it really all gets back to collaboration. We do have to just do it. Um, and then also the importance of ensuring that while many of, um, of the tech companies and the way they operate is global, that we have to ensure that when we're thinking about the ways in which um, our products and technologies are going to operate in the world, we have to engage locally to ensure that any solutions that are produced, whether it be an app or anything else, are informed by and developed by and have ownership um, in the local communities in which um, they seek to be a solution to a problem. Excellent. Olamidi. Yep. Perhaps we have um, representatives of the big tech companies here. The only thing I want to leave us with is um, the problem we have in my own constituency in Nigeria. That's the legal, that's the justice constituency. Um, so basically the problem with us, the first problem or the major problem is delay in justice delivery, delay in judgment delivery. Some cases could last 30 years. 40 years in Nigerian courts, and most of the time, because of the workload of the judges, the time they need to write judgments, they can't really, really handle it. So if we have big tech companies who can, I know there are so many legal softwares now that help lawyers to perform their task. If we could also have tech 
companies who could develop softwares that could assist judges in writing these their judgments and rulings. I, I tell you, a whole lot of our justice problems would have been solved in the country. Thank you. Okay, well, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that uh, the program in Colombia is not working. I was at the launch of that program a couple of years back. If I remember the program name is Computadores para Educar. And I was invited to the launch of that program uh, to speak there, so I, I, I do regret that it's not working. It seemed to me a very good program. Anyway, I want to go to, to, the, to, to the issues raised by the, the, the first question. The issue of rare metals is not an ICT problem. It's a political problem. It's a fight about metals across the world. So the Congo story and the, and the Colton and, the, and, the, and the, all that stuff, we addressed it in, in Jesse 10 years ago. We created an, an initiative called Responsible Minerals Alliance. We have now more than 8,000 companies around that program to address it. But still, it's a problem because governments are taking control and they are fighting for the metals. And, uh, and, uh, and I've been involved in many of those discussions. But I think you raised a very important uh, set of, 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 of issues around technology, which I do agree with. So we, we have an issue that we need to address. You know, technologies can be for the good, but they also have many downsides. And that's why when we put out this report, while we looked at the positives, we also looked at the negatives. E-waste, unsustainable consumption. So, we also, as individuals, we do not behave well. We have two, three mobile phones. We consume a lot. It doesn't make sense. We need to walk the talk as individuals as well. So we need a movement around digital with purpose. We need the civil society, the technology companies, the policymakers to understand that they have to come together to find a way of turning the negatives into the positives. And we can do it. Because we have the know-how, we have the knowledge, we have the will to, to do it. So that's my challenge also to you, to all of you, because this is not a, a thing that we can resolve alone as technology companies. This is something that we need to work, work together. Great, thank you. Digital with purpose. I like that. Giza, please. I want to close by saying that uh, the digital technologies is a tool that allows us and allows our governments and our countries and our people to achieve the SDGs. Digital transformation allows government to improve the delivery in a much faster, efficient and effective way of public services that our citizens much um, need very, very much. There is still the digital divide, and we all have to work together to bridge that divide. And above all, capacity building continues to be the key. Where we see challenges, as I said before, I'm sure if you take a deep look into those challenges, then you can recognize that there, are new, there is a new set of skills, new skill sets, that needs to be nurtured so that together we can achieve all the 17 sustainable development goals. Thank you, Miguel. I would like to finish answering the, the Colombia. Uh, yeah. About the project, I think you're, you're not looking at uh, with the eyes it, you should when you evaluate the stakeholders that maybe you're using to evaluate if it was good or wrong what you did, I think it was great. Because um, if you think of the di digital divide and what you are providing to them, you shouldn't think of uh, after finishing the program, expect to have uh, all software engineers. I mean, anything can happen when you uh, teach the kids to code, for example. It's something great, but you can't expect if them, if them to be better at math or a, a geography, you, you don't know that will happen. But there are a lot of other things that are happening and you don't know just because you're not looking the way you should evaluate. Uh, if you evaluate with the same way you evaluate traditional programs, then obviously it will be wrong. So I would like to just uh, 
give more uh, good expectations about the program and you should hope that it could, it could get better and uh, if you give them connection uh, to internet too, a lot of things, good things could happen. Thank you. Please. Okay, well I know we're coming up on time so I'll make, I'll make mine really quick. Um, I think first off, just thank you for having me here today and uh, thank, thank you for giving me the stage to, to share my thoughts. I just really took down a bunch of buzzwords of what today meant to me. And, you know, I come to you as the private sector first of Benjamin on the phone. Um, I think we've got, you know, two big tech companies sitting here. So, you know, I, I represent IBM and my friend over here represents Google. So I think we are equally, you know, passionate about this. I've got, you know, my colleagues from, uh, from Microsoft who are here. So I think there are a lot of big companies who are here because they care and here because, not just because they have a, a job to do, but because they care about it. So here are my buzzwords that, um, that I took down today that mean something to me. Collaboration, local language content, relevant tools, increasing education, healthcare, and economic outcomes, the inclusion of women and girls, the inclusion of everyone, regardless of your ability, affordability, skills, meaningful skills, internet speed, Policy alignment, but making sure you're thinking about implementation. Protection, and lastly, I believe that digital literacy is a human right. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. I think you, you just made my job really easy because you stole all my buzzwords. <laughs> thank you. Perfect. Um, well, I want to thank my, my panelists. This has been uh, an, an excellent discussion, and when we were chatting before, we thought, wow, two hours. That's a long time, but actually it's not enough time because there were so many, so many issues raised, so many important issues that we actually need to go deeper. Um, I think for me, my, my main takeaway, uh, as, as you rightly said and you started, Melissa, was yes, collaboration, but coming to Mei Ling's point, uh, we need to, to stop talking about collaboration and cooperation and actually do it. Uh, and it really is time to move from talk to action because there are 3.6 billion people out there waiting for us. Uh, and as we heard on the panel and we heard yesterday and in day zero, we're never gonna have enough teachers, we're never gonna have enough doctors, and we're never gonna have enough nurses out there. And so really connectivity is the opportunity. It's the opportunity for the world to address some of the greatest development challenges out there. And yes, there's risks. Lots of risks, and we've heard about them. And Luis, as you were saying, you know, we need to figure out a way that the good uh, can, can outweigh the bad because connectivity can help us. I really believe it is the key enabler. Um, it's not the end in and of itself. It's a tool to help us to achieve the 17 sustainable development goals. I think it is a moral imperative, and I really do think it's the only way uh, that we will ever have a hope and a chance to achieve uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, please, first I want to thank uh, the, the, the MAG for um, inviting us all to be here. Really, it's been a great honor and, and pleasure for me. So uh, thank you, Miguel, and thank you, uh, Timea. Really, it's been, it's been great uh, to thank the captioners who've been doing a great job, uh, and also to thank those that were following remotely. Uh, it's great to know that there's so many active remote participants of course, to thank you all uh, here for being so engaged. Uh, and of course, to thank my amazing panelists. It's really been an honor and a pleasure for me to facilitate the discussion this afternoon and really look forward to working with all of you because we've got a lot of work to do and it's time for action. I thank you very much. And thank you very much to you, Doreen. Thank you for moderating us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.